short word of prayer before we begin. Father God, what a privilege it is for us to be here in your house of worship with people who love you. And I just beg today that your spirit would be here. Speak to me and through me for your glory is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Is there anybody here old enough to still appreciate the wireless, the radio? I was driving along in my car the other day and Spotify was resting and my iPhone was silent and I was doing old school, I was listening to Radio National and they were interviewing a neuroscientist by the name of David Eagleman. Anyone familiar with David Eagleman? He's a very, very famous neuroscientist. Ty Gibson speaks of him. He's been very influential in our generation in bringing, I guess, to the lay people some of the joys of his inquisitive study into the way the mind works. When David Eagleman was a very young boy, he had the privilege of falling off a roof. And he distinctly remembers as he plummeted to, I think, either a very hard pavement or a pile of bricks that managed to smash the cartilage in his nose, that the time that it took from falling off the roof to actually landing on the ground seemed longer than ordinary time. I don't know if any of you have spoken to anyone who's been involved in a, in, in a traumatic motor vehicle accident or some, some significant event has happened where they make the observation that time seemed to stand still, their life flashed before their eyes. Are you familiar with this terminology? And David Eagleman was so intrigued by this event of falling off the roof and plummeting towards the ground and, and the way that time seemed to just stretch for him that he decided to devote his life to the study of the perception of time. For millennia, Lockie, my um, iPad is, is talking, but it's not talking to your um, thing there. Can you just see if you can, um, there we go. Yeah, for millennia, time was sensed to be something that was very objective, concrete, locked and fixed. And then this guy, Albert Einstein, comes along and um, how many of you for light reading in the quietness of your evening as you're about to drift off to bed, immerse yourself in some of Einstein's equations and its consequences? I, I consider myself to be kind of on the right side of the bell curve when it comes to understanding maths and physics. But for me, Einstein just blows me away. I, I spend hours perusing his equations and trying to understand black holes and the, the, the stretching of time. And this equation up here, for those of you who do like reading in Einstein, will be very familiar to you. Einstein came along with his idea that time is actually not as objective as we think it is, but it is actually subject to the relative observations of people who are measuring it. And if you took two people and you put one of them in a spaceship and sent them around the universe, and if they were able to get very close to the speed of light and come back to this earth, you would actually find that these twins were now different ages. And I'm not here today to try and explain to you Einstein's theory of relativity and his capacity to talk about the idea that time can be stretched and compressed depending on how close you are to the speed of light. I want to stick with David Eagleman who makes a lot more sense to me and he is basically talking not about actually stretching time quantitatively but stretching it qualitatively. Our observations and our perceptions can be different. And what David Eagleman has spent his life researching and has published and done much research is the idea that our brain seems to allocate and partition itself in such a way that we prioritise novelty. Now we use novelty in the English language to often describe something that is trite or superficial or plastic or made in China. But novelty in its truest sense is just a fancy word for newness something that is new. And David Eagleman has spent a, a lifetime of research observing and quantitatively analysing the experience of people and is fairly confident in his published research that if we want to add life to our years, we can't stretch the years but we can pack more into them by embracing novelty, by being curious, by having an inquiring mind. Let me illustrate. How many of you here today can remember something about the day 
September 12, 2001. Who can remember what they were doing? Ben, what were you doing? Yeah. yeah. Ian, can you remember what you were doing on September 12, 2002? See, I should have asked someone with an IQ under 160. <laughs> because I've got a very clear recollection of the morning of September 12, 2001. I think most of us do, who were alive at that time. As we were alerted to the fact that something was happening that was changing history. And most of us will have a very acute sense of the, the, the morning as we woke up to the news that something had happened that would never happen again. But I can't even remember what I had for lunch last Monday. I can remember childhood experiences at Soldiers Beach near Lake Macquarie. I can remember my Pathfinder expeditions and, and camperies when I was a young child. I can remember my piano teacher hitting my fingers with her pencil and telling me that I needed to keep them curved and not straight. There are a lot of experiences that the first time it happened are imprinted on my brain and they're partitioned in such a way that I can recall them, but things that are mundane and repetitive pass into insignificance. My nana was a cool nana, and we used to get in our car and drive the little blue Tirana all the way down the highway. Back in those days, it could take almost 10 hours from Brisbane to get to Kurumbong. Now you can do it in close to eight, which is lovely, but we'd arrive in Kurumbong and... Um, We'd get there and my nana had this old kind of fashion clock that would ding every 15 minutes. Anyone had a clock like that? And then on the hour it would chime how many moments it was. And the minute my nana went to bed, I would run around the house and get every bit of linen and towel and cushion that I could find and try and smother this clock. Because I was convinced that bears hibernating in Alaska were being woken on the hour as this thing would dong away. And my nana would sleep sweetly like a baby. And I thought, how can this be? How many of you, when you go into a hotel or motel room, switch off the fridge? I find it really difficult to sleep when I have all of these new sounds stimulating my mind to think about adventures and, and, and extraneous thoughts that instead of falling into a state of restful sleep, my mind is just triggered. And if every 15 minutes in an hour I'm given a stimulus to wake up, I just can't do it. And so that was one of the great adventures at Nana's place was how could I smother the clock? She would sleep like a baby, completely oblivious to its donging. I've noticed as a dentist that people will sit in my chair and the first time I, I, I do something on them, um, they'll jump and they'll, they'll express surprise. But after an hour or 90 minutes of root canal, they'll be sleeping sweetly in my sleep without any anaesthetic agent. The, the brain is just focused on new and different stimulus. When you put your shoes on and you tie up the laces, you can feel the leather pressing on the arch of your foot. But five minutes later, you won't even be aware that you've got shoes on your feet. And our brain does this because it's a way that it focuses attention where attention needs to be focused. And how many of you who are getting a little bit older, and this is a very scary thought, are driving down the road and you can't remember whether you looked left and right at the roundabout or whether you stopped at a red light? <laughs> Could be a good time to go and see your doctor if it happens too often. But there are some times when I'm driving to work and I'm horrified and I think, I just went through the roundabout, I cannot remember looking or checking or putting on my indicator, or pressing the brake light. It becomes so mundane and so repetitive that my brain simply gives it no thought, no priority. It's just let go. And this is what David Eagleman has discovered, that novelty seems to stretch time. Eagleman has made the observation that most of us would agree with, that we can't all get in rockets and travel at close to the speed of light to see if we can stretch time. But what we can do is to recognise that if we want to live our lives to the full, we should remain curious. We should remain alert. We should be wanting to investigate and experience new things. Would you agree? 
And those of us who are here with grey hairs and have a few more years on my young, um, sprightly self at a tender age of 54 will be able to say that life is better if you live in a wider horizon. Would you agree? That you travel, that you taste new things, that you meet new people, that you, you're constantly wanting to bring into your life something that is new and curious and, in, and, and, and different. This is what makes our life rich. Around this time last year, our lives were interrupted by something very novel. We call it the novel coronavirus. A new coronavirus that hadn't been seen before. Our bodies weren't ready for it. We had no built-in immunity. There was no herd protection against it. And it has devastated our world. Would you agree? We kind of live in this isolated cocoon here on the northern rivers of Australia. And we see on the news how it's impacting our southern cousins and, 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 and our distant relatives um, over the Pacific and Atlantic Ocean. And there are some countries that for 2020 and 21 have a much more devastating impact than has been for us who may have suffered some financial disadvantage um, and may have relatives or friends or family in distant lands that have suffered adversity because of it. But you would agree with me that not all things novel, not all things new are good. Would you agree? When we get that cancer diagnosis or when we find out from our accountant or the tax office that our assets are really liabilities and um, when relationships go sour or when our stories get interrupted by some form of evil, we, we do recognise that not all novelty is good. And I can imagine that there would be a refugee who lands in Australia expecting new opportunities and new excitement and suddenly finds themselves peering through barbed wire on Manus Island or some remote Pacific location and they've lost their family and they've lost their identity and they've lost their assets and everything is new. And they think for themselves, mm, maybe a bit of newness is good but too much newness is not such a good thing. Would you agree? And so I think that in our lives we need to find that sweet spot where we have enough stability to enable us to enjoy discovery. And if we can find that sweet spot, if we can get that balance just right, then I think that life for us can be great. Stability and surprise need to be held in a balanced tension for us in order for us to live our lives to the full. And so I want to pose the question to you this morning. How does this idea of novelty, of newness, relate to the life of a Christian? There are many people who would observe the Christian community and say, these are just a bunch of people who are stuck maintaining a mundane and repetitive old set of ideas that have long since lost their value in our society. Are you aware of comments and critiques such as that? That there is nothing really exciting about being a Christian. It's, it, it's, it's about a whole bunch of rules and propositions that hold you back and stop you from experiencing the full gamut of human emotion. And this idea that Christianity in some way is restrictive to us is not new. The devil, the deceiver, turns up in the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, with a radical proposition to our first parents. And he comes along to our first parents and he says, is it true that God has said that you will not be able to experience all of the joys that you can see in your immediate proximity? Has God said that you will not eat of every tree that is in the garden? And the aspersion is cast upon the character of God that God somehow is restricting us by putting a fence around us and saying, don't climb over to see if the grass is greener on the other side. And the devil spun the narrative in such a way that Adam and Eve decided to take a risk and a gamble and they took the fruit he was offering them and as a result, evil was introduced into our story. The devil's suggestion that God wants to limit our freedom and to restrict our opportunity is the original lie of the devil. But I would like to suggest that if you actually correctly read Genesis, you will find that while God is certainly asking us to live within the safety of his um, direction, he did actually create us in a way to experience the joy of freedom, the joy of creativity. And there's an obscure text in the early 
part of Genesis that I've never preached on before and probably never will preach on again. Genesis 2.19. And I want you to cast your minds back to the way in which Moses recorded the creation activity. And God is there and Adam is there. He's just been created and God says to Adam, Hey, Adam, I've got a job for you. I want you to name the animals. And so Adam sits down and the animals start to parade before him. I'm not sure exactly how it occurs, but this is how I imagine it. And Adam sees this massive creature with a big furry mane and it just looks magnificent. And we all know that Adam spoke English, don't we? And he just says, yeah, I think this should be called a lion. And God goes, try again. No, God, I want to call it a lion. You've got to call it what I want to call it. I'm pretending to give you freedom, but you haven't got freedom really. It's just an illusion. Is that how it happens? No, Denise, the Bible says, God said to Adam, hey, Adam, go your hardest. Do your thing. Be free. Be creative. Be expressive. If you want to call it a Tyrannosaurus Rex, that's its name. If you want to call it Ardmilo, that's its name. If you want to call it a porcupine or a lion or a giraffe or a rhinoceros, go your hardest. And there's something about the nature of Genesis 2.19 that says God was not there saying to Adam and Eve, I've made you. Now be like exactly I tell you. God created them and he said, you've got two jobs. I want you to go and garden and I want you to go and make babies. I want you to be fruitful and multiply. I want you to go and create spaces and places and invest your individuality in them and make them shine for my glory. Is this the kind of idea that you get from the Genesis reading? That God is not saying you've got to do it my way. God is saying, I've given you creativity and individuality and freedom, and I'm going to let you do it your way, and I'm going to honour that freedom by whatever you decide. If it's within my will, that's what it will be. And I don't get this idea in the book of Genesis that God created us to live in boxes. God created us to enjoy novelty, to embrace the idea that we could explore and be adventurous. And if you read the Old Testament narrative correctly, you will see that the story of the Old Testament is a story of sequences where God kept coming to people and saying, you're living this story, I want to give you the opportunity to live a better story, a different story. I want you to take the gamble and the risk of leaving what is comfortable and pressing out into what is unknown. And it is in that taking a risk that you will receive a reward. And he comes to Abraham, the original person who bore what I guess we could call was the the most clear terms of God's agreement with mankind after Adam and Noah. And he said, Abraham, I want to do something special in your story. I want you to be in close connection with me. I want to be your God. I want you to be on my team. And I want you to leave this space and place. And I want to take you to a new space and place. And in your story, I'm going to invest in your story so that by blessing you, all nations of the earth will ultimately be blessed. This is the story of the Old Testament. 400 years or so after that original promise made to Abraham, God looks and he observes that his chosen people are suffering bondage under a king in Egypt who has forgotten the blessings that Joseph brought to the nation. Joseph, the first type of Jesus, who truly could be said, blessed all nations. Joseph was a saviour of all nations, providing them with grain and wisdom and the opportunity for extended life. But a king arose in Egypt who didn't know the story of Joseph and when it says he didn't know it, it probably means he didn't resonate with it rather than he was was aware of it. And suddenly this group of people are put under the fiercest and cruelest oppression. And God turns up and he says, I've seen the oppression of my people and I want to take them from this space and this place and I want to take them into a promised space and place where I can work with them and through them and in them so that again they can be the people through which all nations of the earth are blessed. Is there risk in newness? There is within each one of us a certain level of comfort with newness. There are some of us who are rather timid and we need to be dragged screaming and kicking from what is safe and secure to experience a new a new experience. I, I can um, remember 
one of the saints of this church. Who can remember the Van Bugganums? Paul, Sheila? When Paul came to our place for lunch, he looked at all of the gastronomic delights presented to him by my wife and picked a potato and tomato sauce. That's all he would try. He was not going in anything that had tofu, anything that had vegan, anything that was remotely looked like it'd come out of a thermomix or a blender. He just, potato, tomato sauce. And I thought, Paul, think of all the joys and delights that you're missing. Kimchi, sauerkraut. These are things I never eat, by the way. <laughs> They're all out there and you just need to have a sense of adventure and dive in and see, yeah, let's see what we can do with um, this new adventure. But there are some people who retreat from that. And it seems that there is something within our human nature that wants to protect us from the risk of new experience. And I find as I read the Old Testament story that I'm terrified by this idea that only weeks out from singing songs of deliverance on the other side of the Red Sea, the nation of Israel go, we want a leader to take us back to where we have been. We want to go back to Egypt we are prepared to accept a life of slavery and oppression if only we can enjoy the safety and security of what is known rather than risk what is unknown. And my observation as I've watched people come into my surgery and I've dreamed for them a bigger dream or, or hoped for them a better hope is that money aside, many people are hesitant and nervous about leaving the familiar to embrace a life of newness and difference. And I want to say to you, as an observer of life, those people who seem to resonate with joy and happiness have got the balance right. They understand the necessity for safety and security and stability, but in their own way and in their own, uh, own individual experience, to lose a sense of inquiry and engagement and the joy of discovery is to limit your experience. Would you agree? And so whether or not it's base jumping from the highest vertical cliff in the Himalaya or whether it's just buying a new thread for the cross stitch, do something new. Do something fresh. Do something different. By the time Jesus turned up, 1,500 years after Moses, the children of Israel had so lost sight of their vision of reaching out and pushing back borders and exploring the adventure of developing relationships and blessing others. They'd become parochial and insular that Jesus turns up and in a real sense says to the people, there needs to be a new kingdom. There needs to be a new covenant. There needs to be a new agreement. John the Baptist turns up as the forerunner of Christ and he says, repent. How many of you feel comfortable with the word repent? Is it a good word? A happy word? Or does it sometimes it bring connotations of self-reflection to the point of becoming a little bit miserable and upset and saying, oh, I'm a worm and no man. I'm, I'm full of reproach. I'm full of guilt. There is certainly an element of that in repentance, but I want to put a new spin on repentance for you today. I want to I take Dago, David Eagleman's idea and see whether or not that's really discovering what God has had for us all along. In some sense, is it possible that repentance, as it literally means in Hebrew, is just a realignment of direction? Repentance in its most literal sense means turning around. And I would like to think that when John came along and said, repent, what he was saying is God has for you a better space and a better place. God has for you a better story. God wants you to start a new chapter in your life. And the story of the new chapter is going to be better than the story of the last. God's love for us is unrelenting. And all throughout the Old Testament, we see God coming to his people, calling them to turn away from the staleness and the insipidness and the, the powerlessness 
of their attraction to heathen worship and say, make connection with the living God, the God who is able to call light from darkness, order from disorder, the God who is able to calm storms, to shut the mouths of lions, to slay 185,000 Assyrians who are troubling you in a single night, to rescue through Gideon with 300 men your nation from the hordes of the Midianites and all their friends. God comes to them and says, come on, let's get back together. Let's reconnect. Let's make our stories align again. I have for you a longing that you will be able to experience life in a better place and in a better space. This is the story of Scripture. And Matthew's first gospel, the first gospel, records Jesus' first words these this way. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying what? Repent. New story, new opportunity, new discovery. This is a time for you to leave what has been and to explore something that is new, fresh, and different. And we don't have the time this morning to mine deep into the way Matthew crafts his gospel. But in your own spare time, if you want to go back and read Matthew's gospel with this lens, Matthew is trying to say to a group of Jewish believers, Jesus is fulfilling every messianic prophecy that has been made in your scriptures. Jesus is the new Moses. Jesus is the new Israel. Jesus, in Matthew's gospel, is born. He goes to Egypt. He goes through baptism, the waters of the Red Sea. He gets to the other side, and just as Moses went up onto Mount Sinai and began to give an exposition of the terms of the agreement, Jesus goes up to a mountain in Matthew's gospel and says, You have heard that it was said of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you, He that looks at a woman to lust after her in his heart has already heard committed adultery. You have heard that it was said of old time, Thou shalt not kill, but I say to you that anyone who has hate for his brother is already a murderer. And what Jesus is doing in Matthew's gospel is becoming for that generation the mediator of a new covenant, of a new story, of a new beginning. And when Jesus comes, he does something radical. And saints, if you've slept through the introduction, wake up for two minutes and then continue your siesta. David Eagleman has raised and inspired a generation of people to leave the familiar, to seek novelty in order to live a rich life. And if you observe on the internet any time, the crazy things that people are doing to feel alive, you sit back and wonder. They will leap off tall buildings with small parachutes and hope that they don't end up in the fertilizer pit. They will swallow poisons. They will swim with sharks. They will hurtle down steep mountains that have never been traversed by a snowboarder or a skier before and take videos of themselves suffering multiple fractures and ending up for months and months in trauma bays in emergency wards. There is a a craving for that adrenaline rush that comes from thrill-seeking. Am I speaking nonsense or have you observed that in our generation? But what does Jesus do? Jesus says the newest thing that you can do is to discover truth in what is already there. Do not think that I have come to bring a new kingdom that is based on something that is so different from what has been known that you can leave what has been established as true in order to discover something new. No, Jesus says, I have not come to destroy the law of the prophets. I've come to rediscover its original meaning. There are thousands of people who leave the fold of the church, of the Christian community, somehow just feeling that they have nothing to really value within the, the, the Christian construct And they go to the Himalaya and they'll find some guru and they'll sit under some tree and they'll meditate as if if everything that they've experienced as a young person has been made irrelevant on their journey of new discovery. And my plea would be that before you leave what you think you know, give God an opportunity to find in what you think you know something new. Is that a challenge? 
When Jesus turned up explaining to the people the original terms of the covenant and the original story of the Old Testament, people like Saul of Tarsus thought it was such a radical challenge to what they were seeking to protect that they turned hostile and began to persecute the Christians for bringing into their space and place heresy. And Jesus was regarded by many within the religious establishment as a heretic because of the way that he explained the original intent of the law. But I would like to suggest that Jesus is not the kind of guy, we can jump a couple of slides ahead for me, Lockie. Jesus was not the kind, oh, I actually go back a couple of slides. Skateboarders going down a hill looking really terrifying. This is the one. That said that if we want to live life to the full, that we should seek novelty in something that is scary, risky, and going to ultimately harm us. If we want to seek novelty, let's find it in the God that says the biggest mistake people make is rejecting something they think they know when they've re never really known it. If God to you is unattractive, then I'm going to suggest you don't know him. God is love. How can we not love him? And if God to you is not love, then give yourself space and place to reject whatever notions you have created and on your knees and with your word and speaking to people that you have respect for, say, help me find a new picture of Jesus that will inspire me to give my life to him because that is where real happiness can be found. Jesus sets himself apart from the plethora of false prophets and false teachers by saying, I have come because I want you to have a full life, a rich life, an abundant life. The Jews were looking for temporal prosperity. They wanted to be rescued from the Romans. Jesus came with a message that says, I don't want to rescue you from the Romans. I want to rescue you from death, from sin. I want to blow your mind. You're narrow, you're insular, you're parochial, you're introspective. You're looking at your own story. I want you to live lives that are looking out for the glory of the universe. I want a bigger story, a bigger picture, bigger hopes, bigger dreams. I don't suspect David Eagleman is active in his local church, but I thank David Eagleman for bringing to my attention again this idea that Christianity is full of joy and opportunity and discovery and adventure. If your Christianity is stale and insipid and mundane, if it's not exciting, if it's become dry and stale, then I want to challenge you. Ask God to take you on a journey of discovery, not in rejecting what you've known, but in truly knowing what you have rejected. Novelty, a new story. This is the gospel. This is the good news. We have in the story of Jesus an example of what love really looks like. We have in the words of the Bible the accounts of a multitude of witnesses that tell us over and over and over again that committing to a connection with God is the most sensible, rational, logical thing that you could do. To turn to God is the most brilliant of all choices and conversely, to leave him out of your story exposes you to the greatest of all risk. I want to challenge you as I challenge myself in this type of time of new normals. Let's get a few spiritual new normals in our life. God is knocking on the door of our hearts and he's saying, I want for you a better story. I want you to be in a better place. I want you to be in a better space. Repentance is that opportunity that we come where we say, yes, God, I want more. I want different. I want something new. And I want to invite you to be bold, to take that step of faith. This idea that God had something better, something bigger, something brighter, was for so many people in the New Testament new that John in his letter to this dear lady says, I'm writing to you and it's not new, but it is new. It's new because it's been lost sight of, but I want you to rediscover it. Jeremiah was a bit of a grumpy, uh, grumpy prophet. He had lots to complain about. His people were in apostasy. And if you read through the book of Lamentations, you can get filled with his sense of despair. 
But hidden in the book of Lamentations is this beautiful passage where Jeremiah the prophet says, as I look around me and I just see chaos and crisis and God's people doing anything other than what they ought to do, my heart is crushed within me and he says, my hope is gone. But then he says this, but this I recall to mind and therefore I have hope. The love of God never ceases. His mercies never end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. As I look around the world today, my heart breaks. As I see people taking up the challenge that David Eagleman has so articulately codified for us. Seek novelty. Be curious. Embrace adventure. But saints, don't think that to do that, you need to give up on what you have already known. Let's be like Jesus. Let's be the restorers, the polishers, the rescuers of truth that has been lost sight of. Jesus speaks to the last generation in these terms. I love you. I want you to be aware that I have a better story. I want you to know that you have a better ending. I want you to know that I have better things in mind for you. And because you are a generation who make the statement, nah, God, we're all good. We've got everything we need, everything we want. We're pretty okay. Our God who loves us says, I'm knocking. I'm knocking on the door of your heart. And I want you to have the courage to let me in. Those who I love, I mess with. I mess with them until they come to a position where they say, yes, Lord, we will embrace novelty. We will do something different. We will do something new. We will reconnect with you. Amen. God, the eternal God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, my prayer today is that each one of us could experience this week something new a new appreciation of your love, a new insight into your truth, a new respect for the sacrifice that you have made for us, a new hope that I, even I, might be one of the redeemed. Lord, may we not be stuck in the staleness and insipidness of a lifeless Christian journey, but may the joy of discovery, the joy of adventure, the joy of a bigger and better story drive us to value the privilege we have of being able to choose to be on your team. May the words of my lips reverberate in the mind of your saints and may they see in your new story their future. Amen.